Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about successor designs and what you typically see on said successor designs. Unless we're looking at aircraft designs from Opposite Land or Andrew's Goof World, somebody watching this will understand that pretty regulation reference, successor aircraft always look to improve upon some aspect of its predecessor. Generally speaking, designers and militaries almost always look to improve upon either speed or armament, and very often both at the same time. Aerodynamic capabilities will be improved upon, the engine will be made bigger or stronger, and more or bigger guns will be added onto the plane's frame. The overall focus of the improvements is largely dictated by the role of the plane, though. Fighters will prioritize speed, maneuverability, and armament. Attack aircraft will prioritize weapon load, weapon variety, armor, and control. Bombers will prioritize range and overall payload, etc., etc. For today, we're going to be focusing more on those fighter improvements. Now, when the design for a successor is open to the public, as it were, and any company and designer can submit a new design, there is no guarantee that the new proposed successor is actually going to be better than the plane it's supposed to replace. On paper, though, it certainly will be, because why would you submit a successor design that's immediately worse overall? But for our subject for today, we have an interesting situation where a company designed a successor for their own aircraft that was heavily based upon the design of their own plane, and it ended up being somehow overall worse. How exactly did they manage that? This is Curtis's first direct successor to the P-40 Warhawk. This is the Curtis XP-46. Its story begins in the late 1930s, in the lead-up to the Second World War. In the years prior to the official start of the war in September 1939, the sort of dress rehearsal for the European theater, the World War II preseason, if you will, the Spanish Civil War, offered some initial insights into the future of military technology. These insights came arguably a bit more from the nationalist side rather than the republic side, though, as many of the major powers in Europe elected to, at best, have a very arm's-length relationship with the conflict. But the same couldn't be said for the Axis powers in Europe, in Germany and Italy, though, who provided support to the nationalists. And in their support, some more modern German and Italian military aircraft would fight in Spain. Perhaps most critically, this included fighters like the BF-109 and HE-112, Germany's primary fighter in World War II and one of its competitors, respectively. As engineers and observers from American companies were over in Europe, learning from allies like Britain, and they were also in Spain to bear witness to and learn from the Civil War, when they returned to the States with their newfound knowledge, it was likely the presence of these more modern German fighters and the presence of newer British fighters like the Spitfire and Hurricane that spurred companies like Curtis to propose new fighters and significant upgrades to their existing ones. And while Curtis's own P-40 Warhawk would only be introduced into service in 1939, Curtis and others began making plans for its successor. And at least for Curtis's in-house successor, the new design really wouldn't be that much different. Curtis and the others learned that they needed to improve their fighters all around in basically every aspect. They needed better maneuverability, they needed greater speed, and they needed a more powerful armament. And while it's not like the P-40 as it stood in the pre-World War II era was terrible or anything like that, and realistically, once the war actually started, it became one of the most underrated planes that served, it didn't really wow in any significant regard. Overall, throughout its entire career, its best ability was its availability, basically. But in its earliest iterations, the P-40 definitely had a lot of room to grow, 
With its good but not great speed, its rather lackluster armament of just a pair of 50 cal machine guns, and also its surprisingly solid maneuverability, but Curtis still believed that they had room to improve it in that regard as well. So to serve as this all-around improvement, Curtis designed, in essence, a slightly different P-40 with some European influence and flair, measuring in at 9.19 meters long, 10.46 meters wide, and 3.07 meters tall, Curtis's new design was slightly smaller than the P-40, with the length being cut by about half a meter and the width by about a meter. The size reduction was done both in an effort to reduce the gross weight and further improve the plane's maneuverability. Up in the nose would be the same engine as the baseline P-40, the Allison V-1710, but they would use an improved version of it in the V-171039 that had slightly more power, up to 1150 horsepower, and it had overall better performance. Instead of going with the chin-mounted radiator that would be pretty famous on the P-40, the new design would shift the radiator back more towards the center of the fuselage, as was seen on the very earliest versions of the P-40. Also around the center, the landing gear of the new design would be modified as well, and instead of the wheels sitting narrow next to the fuselage and retracting to the rear, the wheels would sit more wide and would retract inwards towards the fuselage. Easily the most significant improvement, though, would come in the plane's intended armament. Clearly taking some inspiration from the early Spitfire models, in the nose would remain the two 50 cal machine guns, but in the wings would be an additional eight 30 cal machine guns which was actually incredibly powerful for an American fighter design at the time. While this would be a significant boost over basically every other American fighter in existence, there was a significant detriment in this decision, in that it would significantly increase the gross weight. With this added weight and the lesser wingspan, the wing loading of the design was a good bit higher than the P-40. And to help compensate for this, the wings would be fit with automatic slats for improved control at lower speeds, much like the BF-109 had, so maybe they took influence from that on this. Overall, though, with the increased offensive power and the promise of greater speed, Curtis would receive a contract for two prototypes on September 29, 1939, given the official designation of XP-46. Shortly after this contract was issued, the U.S. Army Air Corps would add in a couple more requirements that on their own were very much beneficial, but in the grand scheme of the overall design, was probably detrimental. The Air Corps wanted Curtis to include an additional 65 pounds worth of armor plating around the pilot and cockpit, and the fuel tank was to be made self-sealing. While this would improve the overall defensive capabilities of the XP-46, it also further added to the weight of a design that was intended to be lightweight. These additional improvements brought the gross weight of the XP-46 up to 7,665 pounds, which actually made it ever so slightly heavier than the early P-40 models, with the P-40B, for example, weighing around 7,600 pounds. While those early model P-40s had top speeds that sat roughly around the 340 to 350 mile an hour mark, Curtis would still project a top speed upwards of 410 on the XP-46. As the first two XP-46s were being made, Contracts started being signed and plans were being laid out to export the design over to France and Britain under the official designation H-86A. Shortly after the mock-up, XP-46 was inspected and approved on March 4th, 1940, an agreement made on April 18th effectively earmarked the XP-46 for export to European countries. France would place an initial order for 140 aircraft on May 10th, 
and Britain, at the very least, would give the XP-46 the official service name of Kitty Hawk, and later they would place an order for over 500 aircraft. With these plans being put into place well before the XP-46 would even take to the air, it seemed to be just about set in stone that the XP-46 would be accepted and brought into production. A very short time later, though, the Army Air Corps took a pickaxe to that stone and proposed that Curtis, while work was still being done on the XP-46 prototypes, modify the baseline P-40 model to fit that more powerful V-171039 engine. This would be proposed by the Air Corps in an effort to help keep aircraft production steady, as existing production lines would have to be halted and altered for Curtis to start production of the XP-46. Curtis would agree to this, and modified the P-40 design significantly enough that they decided it needed a new internal company designation, not a new official designation though. The original P-40 model was internally called the Model 81, and the new design would be called the Model 87. And in September 1940, well before either it or the XP-46 took to the air, the Army Air Corps would order the Model 87 under the official designation of P-40D into production. So this put the XP-46 in a very precarious situation. Not only did the P-40D use the exact same higher power Allison engine, which was kind of like a quarter of the reason the XP-46 existed in the first place, but the P-40D would also propose an improved armament that was, at a baseline, probably about equal to the XP-46, and at its very best, much better. The P-40D was proposed to have just a four-gun armament, but four 50-cal machine guns, opposed to the XP-46 and its two 50-cal and eight 30-cal guns. While the XP-46 did have six more guns in total, the 30-cal was actually pretty weak for the World War II era, and so I figure that two 50 cal guns might be probably equal to the 830 cal. Making things worse for the XP-46, though, was the fact that the P-40D was also proposed to have two additional guns, two 20 mil cannons, which would easily make the P-40D stronger than the XP-46. Now, this never came to fruition, but still. Realistically, the only thing that could save the XP-46 now was its potential greater speed and maneuverability, and if it managed to hit its projected 410 miles an hour, then maybe there would still be a reason to pursue it. Upon taking to the air for the first time on February 15, 1941, at first glance, it appeared as though the XP-46 did indeed reach its projected top speed, and thus still had a reason to exist. However, it reaching this top speed was merely a mirage of sorts. While it did in fact hit that top speed in level flight, there was a massive caveat that the XP-46 that took to the air basically had nothing of any substance in it, no armor, no armament, no radio equipment, no self-sealing fuel tanks. This prototype was effectively a skeletonized version of the XP-46, and it wouldn't be until September 22, 1941, that the second prototype took to the air with all of its combat equipment. The significant increase in weight that came with it brought the top speed down from 410 to 355 miles an hour. Meanwhile, back in May 1941, the P-40D had taken to the air for the first time and displayed performance that was at least equal to the fully loaded XP-46, if not slightly better. So, with the rather disappointing performance of the second XP-46 prototype, this was the final nail in its nearly sealed shut coffin, and the XP-46 project would come to an end. 
All the way back in late 1940, though, with the XP-46 project already in severe trouble at this point, with the P-40D project starting to get off the ground, Curtis did propose a preemptive improvement upon the XP-46 in the XP-53, which would be modified to fit eight 50 cal machine guns and a Continental I-1430 Hyper engine with 1600 horsepower. However, this project too would end in failure due to the failure of the I-1430 engine. But the line of attempted improvements would continue onto the XP-60. But that plane was the main subject of a previous video that you can watch here, link in the description. As for the XP-46 project, let's say hypothetically that it managed to outperform the P-40D. Would it have been accepted for production then? Personally, I think unless it actually hit over 400 miles an hour while fully loaded, probably not. The boost in performance certainly would have been nice, but the interruption to production lines of a plane in the P-40 that, for one, was easy and cheap to produce, for two, was reliable, and for three, was desired by other Allied powers, it really wouldn't have been worth it. The P-40, as it stood even there, was just too valuable. I mean, why stop production of a solid and pretty versatile aircraft just so you can introduce a very slightly better model? All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. So the other day, I learned that at some point, there was a World of Warcraft trading card game. I found some of the cards in a thrift store randomly, and as somebody who used to play World of Warcraft, I had to buy them. Now, do I intend to actually play the card game that's associated with it? No. Do I intend to start playing World of Warcraft again? Uh, no, because I kind of got addicted to that game at one point, and you'll probably never see me again if I started playing it again. I just bought the cards on a whim, and I think they're kind of neat to look at, though. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.